very warm welcome. You're joining us here on a new episode of Melt. I'm Ritwika Gupta reporting from my home. This week, we are continuing our coverage from ZMelt 2020. And today we are going to present highlights from a presentation by Chuck Porter, Chairman Crispin Porter and Bogaski. Chuck Porter is renowned for truly disruptive advertising communication. He joined the Crispin Agency in 1988 as creative director and partner after a long career as an award-winning freelance copywriter. Under his leadership, Crispin Potter and Bogaski has become one of the most awarded agencies in the world and was honored as Agency of the Decade by Advertising Age in 2009. His session today is titled, Finally, the Real Answer as to When We'll Get Back to Normal. Let's get ready to melt with Chuck Potter. What I want to talk about is an honest answer as to when we'll get back to normal. And I know that, that this is a topic that is on everyone's mind. Um, I've, I've looked at it very carefully. I've tried to get some research done as to what day we're actually going to get back to the way things used to be. And the answer is never. Um, it, it's, we are facing a change here for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, and you all know what they are. First of all, we've got a worldwide pandemic um, we haven't had for more than 100 years. Secondly, there's a dramatically heightened emphasis on social issues. Um, and there's extreme polarization, political polarization and polarization on a lot of issues. And, and it's a global phenomenon. I mean, if you, if you watch television, um, every day you will see demonstrations happening on every continent um, except Australia. Um, so we're facing a lot of different things, but everybody already knows this. What's the point? The point is I think this is going to change the way the marketing world works. Um, I think the way in which marketers use agencies and consultants will change. Um, I think the way people work every day will change. Um, and I think the way marketers address social issues will change. Uh, and I think I want to I wanna have a, a sort of a disclaimer here. Um, I'm going to say a lot of stuff, uh, but these are just my opinions. I don't pretend to be a futurist. My philosophy for my whole career is do something great today and tomorrow will take care of itself. And I still believe that, but I think that um, right now, some of, the, some of the changes that are gonna happen, even for someone who's not a futurist, um, are, are pretty inevitable. Um, I think the marketing world was already beginning to move um, and embracing sort of new values, including fast, nimble, flexible, um, and cost-effective. Um, I think those things were, were already happening, but I think that these, this combination of events has caused the future to get here like a freight train, and, and I think it's already happening. Um, the fact is the advertising business was already shrinking, but now with this, it's shrinking more. Um, in some research from Forrester, they predict that in 20 and 21, agencies will shed more than 50,000 jobs. Um, and another major advertiser was quoted in the New York Times in the last couple of weeks saying this. Um, and, and, you know, if you're in the advertising or production business, you read a quote like this and say, no sh um, that This is a trend that's happening. And I think um, we were lucky because we were able to get in fairly early um, when early in March, when the shutdown began to happen in the US, I think we made the first um, com iPhone commercial that ran it was for Domino's. It went like this. Hi, I'm Lolly, a Domino's franchisee. As you can see, we're open and working hard to safely keep putting food on people's tables. And we could use your help doing that. If getting some full or part-time work during these tough times could help you. Domino's is hiring. Head to jobs.dominos.com and apply today. Because we're not only committed to putting food on people's tables, we're committed to helping you put food on your table. These are becoming very common now. People are shooting everything on, on video. And I think 
what this kind of a trend is going to mean to the production community, um, I think to I think to a large degree it's goodbye Hollywood and goodbye Bollywood for that matter. I think that that big long term productions are going to get fewer and fewer. But I don't think it's bad news because I think that there's going to be an increasing demand for lots of content in terms of marketing communications, in terms of all kinds of content. So people are going to be making a lot, a lot of work, I think, way more than they used to. Um, I just think that there are going to be many fewer location shoots in the Alps um, and more shoots in, in people's kitchen. Um, I also think that, that fewer marketers are going to want to spend time talking to layers of management um, and to basically salespeople. I think more and more marketers are going to be wanting to talk to the people who actually do the work. Uh, that seemed to me a, to be a trend that was happening and is another trend that's accelerating. Um, I think another thing that's going on and a, and a pretty important dynamic is that these days, everyone knows everything. Um, it's, there's, there's not a, a lot of value in scale in terms of finding out about your audience, finding out about trends, finding out about, about where the world is going or how you're doing. If anything, we have too much data. The fact is your mobile phone knows more about you than your mother does. Um, it knows it knows where you go. It knows what you like. It knows what you buy. It knows whom you talk to. And this is information that's becoming more and more accessible to all kinds of people. So understanding the audience and, and creating strategies around what the audience wants is not a thing that requires scale anymore. Um, pretty much everyone can do it. Um, right now, people have more access to the data from their audience than they ever have before in history. Um, and I think all of these things are, are, have been accelerated by this. Um, and I don't really have, I don't have an agenda and I don't have a, I don't have a stake in this game. I'm not advocating anything, but I think an interesting exercise is to think about when it comes to creating marketing communications, you know, for yourself, think about what's good about big and what's good about small. Um, I mean, if you feel like it, it's a, it's a sort of an interesting way to think about, to think about, I think, where you want to be. Um, and now, this, this all sort of sounds sort of pessimistic and kind of doomsday, like, oh, my God, the industry is shrinking and this is all bad news. And, and that's the furthest thing from the way I feel. I feel like we're going to emerge from this as a much better industry, more interesting, more fun, more exciting. Um, I, think, I think it's all going to be a good thing. For one thing, I think change is usually good. Um, I think change usually creates a better situation than it left. And also, um, I know one thing for a fact, and that is the world will always be in a race for talent. Um, people who are really good are always going to be in demand, and they're going to find their own ways to work. Our, our hiring criteria, when we grew from 30 people in my agency, from 30 people to 1,000 people, our criteria for hiring were these, smarts, talent, passion, curiosity, and experience in that order. And I think that people who have these qualities are always going to be in high demand, regardless of, of what the overall industry looks like. So I think it's not bad news. In fact, I think people are going to find more and more ways to create their own niches. I work with a with a brilliant um, uh, programmer down in Brazil, and he calls himself a code poet, um, which I haven't heard before, but it's a perfect description of, of how this guy programs and creates sites. And, and there are new categories. I mean, in, in freelance, which is becoming huge everywhere, there are all these new categories. I heard a term, I read a term in, in, the, in the New York Times recently, which is called pre-tired. And this is a, an audience there. This is a group of people who have done some brilliant work at a lot of agencies. And 
they don't want to be in the agency world anymore, but they're not ready to leave. So they're a cohort called pre-tired people. Um, and it's, 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 I think freelance is going to take a lot of different directions like this. Um, the fact is right now we're all freelance because nobody can go to work. So the question a lot of people are asking is now that the world is beginning to open up country by country and city by city, what's it going to look like when people come back to work? And I think a lot of people think it's going to look like this. A lot of people think that people are just not going to come back to work. Um, that may or may not be true. I'm not sure, but I think uh, the evidence points the other way. I mean, it, 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 in a survey of college students in the U.S., almost a third of them believed that working from home was a right, not a privilege, which mitigates for staying at home. And if you look at some very big organizations, Twitter, Square, Shopify, Slack, and Zillow have all said nobody has to come back to work if they don't want to. Amazon and Facebook have both said, look, people are going to come back to work, but not the way they used to. And it, it's going to be a very different paradigm in terms of the way people work. I don't think we'll ever get back to this. I don't think we'll ever get back to the world where everybody goes to work in the morning and everyone goes home in the afternoon. Um, people have found new freedom now and new ways to do things. So I think that I think that the, that the sort of nine to five world, particularly in our industry, is pretty much a thing of the past. But I think people will still go to work. There are so many benefits. I mean, we did a survey in our agency saying to people, do you want to get the office back open as soon as we can? And more than two thirds of them said, yes, yes. They're not going to want to come to work the way they used to, but they want to get out and go to work. So I think that I think that there is going to be a working, I think there is still a lot of people who are going to want to, for the rest of their lives, work remotely from a beach in Goa. And I say, that's cool, go for it. But I think that's going to be the exception rather than, a, rather than the rule. And I think not only are the way people are going to work is going to be different, but the kind of, the way people choose their jobs is going to be different. Um, uh, according to some Allostat data, um, in the next 10 years, millennials and Gen Z are going to represent 72% of the workforce. And their data also said that 40% of millennials have reported that they made a job choice. They picked one job over another based on environmental issues, how sustainable the products were, how committed the company was to environmental issues. So people are, are not only talking about this, they're actually, you can't really trust what people say, but you can believe what they do. And these are people who are actually making choices based on, on their beliefs. And I think that that's going to increase. Um, and there's another study that was done. I think it's an interesting study because it was a global study, but the three countries that were represented the most were the US, the UK, and India. And what this study found is that 74% of the people they talked to in across age groups expect brands to take a position on issues important to them. So this to me is going to be the key thing or a key thing that brands face going forward. In this part of his presentation, Chuck Potter talks about what brands need to keep in mind while creating communication for a post-COVID world. Take a look. When we talk about communicating in, in, as it relates to current events, there are two different things. First, there's a crisis, and a crisis is like a hurricane or a flood or a pandemic. And a crisis at the beginning, we're all on the same side. It may become political later, but at the beginning, we're all on the same side. And the other, the other factor is causes, which really should probably be called issues. And that's a different thing, because with issues, there are two different sides. I, I think my, my proposal is, or what we try and do with communication in a crisis, when everything is the same, is to be honest, original, and specific. Rather than saying, in times like these, we're all in it together, people say, 
here's what we're doing. We're doing this and this and this. And the fact is, what you do is more important than what you say. And I'm probably going to say this more than once. Um, in a crisis, when you're doing marketing communications, a good response to the crisis is way more valuable than a good commercial. Um, when it comes to issues, issues, like I said, are very different because on issues, there are two sides. I did this um, session at Can a couple of years ago, and it was about how to market to a polarized audience. Um, and it was, it was really, really interesting because sort of what we came around to is that <clears throat> if you're going to take a position on an issue, um, number one, you have to live it. And you have to... You have to be able to accept the fact that you may alienate a part of your audience in order to resonate even more strongly with another part of your audience. So you really have to know your audience. Um, and it, which, which I guess kind of goes without saying, but at times like these, when there is so much heat, I mean, right now, um, I mean, I said this before, what you do in terms of issue communication is, is I, I think the truth is, for most brands, most of the time, in a social media world, what you do is more important than what you say. If you do something that people love, it goes viral, and that's much better than advertising. Um, the thing is, you have to walk the walk. If you're talking about the environment, for example, and the things that you're doing, you're committed to, to protecting the environment. You can't be flying around in a Gulf Stream because you'll get caught and you'll get outed and you're better off not to have said anything in the first place. Um, I think the two issues that, that are obviously rising or, or important right now um, are environment and social justice. And actually, it, the environmental issue has been around for so long, it's become so universal and so pervasive, it's really more of a cause um, than, a, than a social issue. There are still two sides, but one side is getting much, much bigger than the other. Social justice is the hot new issue that obviously we all know is emerging right now. And an awful lot of brands are feeling compelled to, to take a stand on this. Um, and that's a great thing. And if you feel a moral imperative to take a stand on it, I would say absolutely do it. If you feel a moral imperative for your brand or your organization to, to take a stand here, that's great. There are still a lot of, of wrongs that need to be righted. Um, but what's happening with this is it's become so hot so fast that it feels like insurgency and revolution is the new cool. Um, and it's easy to jump on that bandwagon or it's easy to be tempted to jump on that bandwagon. You know, people don't, people don't always tell the truth, but the way people behave tells you what they're really thinking. And there's still a very fundamental streak of conservatism that, that goes across, I think goes across the globe. I mean, look who's the prime minister of Great Britain right now. Um, and also I think it's important to remember that reasonable people can have different opinions. I mean, what we really don't need is more acrimony. What we really don't need is more polarization. I think that brands who can find a way to address current issues with you and in a way that unites people rather than divides them, and, and I mean, this is not a secret, and it's a very hard thing to do, um, I think that that's the big win. ZMEL 2020 also allowed delegates to interact with the speakers, and Chuck Porter was asked quite a few questions. Here are some of the highlights from the Q&A session with Chuck Porter. I think the answer is no. I think that a, a lot of clients have gotten used to creating stuff, and I don't really even think it's so much the cost. Um, I don't think that, that the fact that productions have gotten cheaper is the real big issue. I think the real big issue is the responsiveness. I think... I think the real big issue is, is, is being smaller gives you the opportunity to turn on a dime. There are still going to be big productions, but I think that a lot of marketers are going to find that being flexible and nimble and quick 
um, is going to give them more advantages than than creating blockbuster commercials. They'll still happen, but I think that we have had a fundamental change. And like I say, I think it partly has to do with money. A lot of marketers have gotten used to this. They've gotten used to be able to being able to create a message that rather than waiting for months to get it all produced, they can be on the air Friday. And, and for a lot of marketers, that's pretty compelling. I don't disagree with you. Not all brands are original or honest or whatever, but I think that, that those are the sort of the attributes they should strive for in their communications. You never know what's going to go viral. We were very, very lucky because very early on when we had Burger King, we did this stupid thing with a chicken that went insane. You know, it got 400 million hits in a week. We had no idea. And then very shortly after that, we did a very brilliant, um, I think, digital campaign for many that we knew would go viral, and it didn't. So you cannot predict what's going to go viral. But what I think is there are people with better instincts than other people, and you can find people who have good instincts about that. You need to read the audience, and you need to do a lot of content. I mean, I think that you know, like I said before, the, the, the agency industry may be shrinking, but the opportunity for creating marketing communications is growing because, it, because the need for content is growing. So it's overall good news. And I think you never know what's going to go viral, but the more things you try, the more likely you are to have a hit. And that was Chuck Porter giving us an overview of how the post-COVID world will bring about significant changes to advertising and how marketers can make sure brands are prepared to meet these changes. You can watch the full session and all other replays on zmelt.com. The VOD has been extended till 3rd November 2020. Now let's take a look at the Melt Sheet Sheet. The pandemic will change how marketers interact with agencies and consultants. The marketing world will become fast, nimble, flexible, and cost-effective. There will be an increase in demand for more and varied content. Communication during a crisis needs to be honest, original, and specific. In times like these, brands need to understand that a good response to a crisis is way more valuable than a great advertisement. With that, it's a wrap on this episode of Melt. Don't forget to follow us on social media. Our handle is ready to melt and stay connected with our daily Melt update on our website, readytomelt.com. I'll see you next week, same time, same place. Goodbye.